welcome. This is Caroline Petit speaking from London um, in the context of the Classical Civilization Teachers Day organized by the University of Warwick in the Department of Classics and Ancient History. So my name is, is Caroline Petit and if you <laughs> looked up my name in advance you probably saw I'm an expert in ancient medical text. And you may wonder what the connection is with my topic today as I volunteer to speak about the invention of the barbarian. Right, in reality, I have a point, I promise. Um, and I'd like to, to share some ideas with you about this topic um, on the back of um, a few years thinking uh, partly about this question, only marginally in my work, but uh, as a matter of fact, I ended up um, uh, writing a book which is not without links with this question of the barbarian in classical Greece. So, um, where do I come from? As I said, I work on ancient medical texts and one point I would like to make today is that uh, classical Greek medical text may have something to contribute to the topic and I will discuss in particular uh, a Hippocratic work called Airs, Waters and Places, um, which uh, has been connected to the work of Herodotus. And, uh, and uh, I want to explore with you the uh, possible relevance of Hippocrates' um, words um, uh, with uh, the, the, the question of uh, Greeks versus barbarians in, uh, in the classical world. That's one point. My other point um, is that um, I actually um, ended up being involved in a project on ancient villains. There is a connection. Um, and um, I ended up looking at barbarians as part of this project on villains. Now, maybe I need to explain a tiny bit more about this project. Um, I was commissioned uh, a book in a French series published by Les Belles Lettres. Uh, this is an example of it. So it's uh, a series of um, inexpensive uh, short books on uh, modern questions, usually um, tackled from the, the perspective on, of ancient text in a variety of ways. So the editor uh, of the book has a certain freedom to explore the topic as they please. And uh, so in my case, I ended up being commissioned um, the volume on villains, so there are a lot of different topics uh, in the, the series. It has over 30 titles at, at the moment. And um, I ended up being commissioned that one because I, you know, the editor of the series, who's a long time friend, um, said to me, she couldn't find anyone for this topic. And I was like, well, oh, it's surprising. It's such an exciting topic. I'd love to do that. And before I knew it, I signed a contract and I ended up having to write that book, um, which took me a lot further than I originally thought. Right, so um, the way this book works, um, the, the, the series consists usually of anthologies of ancient texts uh, on this particular topic and um, the topic you choose. And it's, um, usually, it usually has either a preface or some kind of interview with questions and answers uh, with a modern personality who's um, work or ideas are relevant to the topic. So it's a way to kind of connect ancient and modern thinking on a particular question. And so with the villains, um, I ended up uh, having this um, very exciting interview with uh, Daniel Mendelssohn, uh, whom you may know from various angles because he, he has uh, written on a lot of different topics in reality, uh, but they somehow uh, all connect to this question of, of evil in a way or another. So uh, you may know his work on Euripides because he started off as a, as a classicist, a specialist of Euripides and Greek tragedy, um, and, um, and then became uh, editor at large of the New York Times and um, you may know maybe his uh, newspaper articles. Or perhaps you've read his uh, book on um, his inquiry into the fate of his relative who died 
um, persecuted by the Nazis during the Second World War in Ukraine. Uh, it's called The Lost, and it's a multi-award winning book. Um, I think uh, it's, it's perhaps his, his most uh, famous um, work. So anyway, I ended up uh, discussing uh, ideas around evil uh, from the perspective of the ancients and the moderns, uh, trying to look at those questions um, through time and, and to, to, to try and find, my aim was to find uh, archetypes in, uh, in ancient and early modern and modern literature uh, to help me think about the, the topic. And uh, so I read very widely. Um, I ended up selecting over 100 passages for the book, um, um, ranging from you know, Greek to Latin literature, from Homer to late antiquity, uh, pagan and Christian texts alike. Um, so I looked at evil from as, as many angles as, as, as I could. And as a matter of fact, one of the chapters is uh, titled um, uh, L'invention de la barbarie, so uh, the invention of the barbarian, if you want. Uh, so this is part of my, my topic, uh, really. And uh, another chapter is dedicated to women. Uh, which brings me closer to another aspect of your syllabus, Medea. Um, and in fact, Medea, as somehow the arc criminal uh, for the ancients, um, uh, appears in several chapters of the book. So I thought it could potentially be, you know, useful or at least not, not entirely useless to, to discuss um, some of those uh, ideas with you. Uh, as I come to, um, as I'm about to bring that project to a close, uh, it will be coming out next year um, in, uh, with Les Belles Lettres. So, um, so that's my kind of uh, introduction, that, that's my perspective, where I come from. Right, so I would like to uh, look at in a bit more detail at um, First of all, the idea of the barbarians, um, in fact, beyond uh, the text of your um, syllabus. Um, so instead of talking about Herodotus, really, I will not talk about Herodotus. I will talk about uh, a contemporary of Herodotus. Uh, we, we don't really know uh, his name. And it's the, the author of a text called Airs, Waters and Places, transmitted under the name of Hippocrates. Hippocrates, the doctor, the so-called father of medicine. And um, um, so we, we, maybe I should present uh, slightly the, this text in case you do not uh, know it. Although I expect if you have um, explored this question of uh, Greeks versus barbarians at the time, it, probably the, the title of Airs, Waters and Places came up at some point in your research. Um, anyway, in case it hasn't, um, Airs, Waters and Places is a text attributed to Hippocrates as uh, many other works from roughly the same period, 5th and 4th century BC. Um, and as far as we are aware, uh, none of those texts can uh, securely be attributed to Hippocrates himself, but somehow the tradition has had uh, those texts associated with the name of the one of the most famous physicians of his time, and that is Hippocrates of Kos. Now, um, a few clues in, the, in this text show us that uh, at least it may have been written by the, the same author as another famous Hippocratic text, and that is on the sacred disease. Um, those texts uh, share a number of uh, ideas about nature and illness and how um, the two are connected, but also how the divine uh, plays a role in this in a, in a kind of distant uh, way. Um, so um, on the sacred disease, I will leave it to Sal aside for now. Uh, it's a very interesting text too, on um, dedicated to uh, the causes and treatment of epilepsy, what we think now is uh, epilepsy, but they call it the sacred disease. 
Right, and uh, Earth's Waters and Places, in turn, is um, well, it's, it's quite a different text. It's uh, certainly aimed at medical practitioners, and it's really rooted in the context of ancient medicine in the classical world, um, in that it refers to medical practice as um, kind of uh, uh, itinerant practice, so traveling uh, around uh, Greece in the broad sense, traveling to places to cure different people each time. Right? So, as Autos and Places is a guide written for such doctors who would have to travel around to, to get uh, some work and treat people in, in, in particular places at, at different times uh, of the year, or maybe they would stay on for a year or perhaps several years. And anyway, it's a guide to help them make sense of uh, uh, um, human nature in relation to, his, uh, to its environment. So it's a work on uh, health and illness, from the perspective of the, all the surrounding factors, so environmental factors in a broad sense, including climate, including geography, um, uh, the waters, the winds, uh, the position of a particular city, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, I would say uh, that this text is um, a very interesting. Uh, comparandum with Herodotus for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, it's written in the same kind of dialect, Ionian Greek, um, and so it's written in the same uh, perspective, you know, from a Greek, it's written by a Greek from Asia, Asia Minor, uh, not by some Athenian, right, from, you know, someone from this area, and whether or not it's the real Hippocrates doesn't really matter, but it's written in the same uh, Ionian language, typical of um, uh, prose writing of, of this time and place of um, uh, the Greeks of um, Asia, of the nowadays uh, Turkish coast, if you want. Um, so, um, this is a common point with Herodotus. Another common point is that this text, like Herodotus's history, uh, kind of borders on uh, ethnography, uh, as if you want to, to connect this text with a modern kind of discourse. And uh, the, the author is led to discuss uh, the features, the characteristics of certain people in relation to their climate and environment. Now, um, the author ends up discussing various populations, the Scythians to the north, he talks about Greeks, he talks about uh, Persians. Uh, in fact, it's a lot more diverse and refined than what sometimes is, it, it's made to, to be um, in modern discussions uh, around um, ancient racism, uh, this text is sometimes brought forward as uh, evidence of ethnocentrism, of uh, racism, of uh, you know, stereotypes against foreigners, etc., etc. Um, now, it is true that uh, I mean, having done some research on uh, ancient discourse on uh, barbarians, um, either non-Greeks or non-Romans, um, I know there are a number of expressions of stereotypes about uh, foreigners uh, ranging from uh, Persians to uh, people from Carthage, uh, Arabs, uh, Gauls, etc. So all this is there in ancient literature quite widely, uh, quite well represented. Uh, my question, I guess, is about um, the actual relevance of uh, modern discourse on, uh, on, on racism uh, for the interpretation of, of, um, of those texts and thinking of Hippocrates as well as in places in particular, it turns out the text has indeed inspired uh, discourse on environmental determinism in uh, the modern period, in the early modern period, let's say, starting with um, Montesquieu in France, um, 
and 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 that went on uh, for quite a while and now there is a discussion as you know about a conversation around what uh, ancient texts can tell us about uh, about race and our own kind of uh, prejudice in, uh, in, uh, in the modern world. Now the case of Airs, Waters and Places is interesting because um, the, the, the question has been going on for a while uh, and asking whether the author can be called a racist uh, quite simply and uh, so I thought I would bring this um, to the, 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 the debate in, in this presentation because it's uh, closely related to, to what Herodotus uh, tries to do in a very kind of similar uh, framework in the fifth century BC right and in, in a very similar language and so on so um, I, I I wanted to share with you uh, some uh, of those some aspects of the discussion. One is a recent, a very recent blog uh, published, I think, in the wake of recent events um, by uh, Liesl Walsh. Uh, and I'm going to share um, the reference on um, a slide now. Right. Uh, so you do have a reference at the bottom here with a link to um, this blog by Liesl Walsh. And um, it's about the history of translations of this text and how um, the way uh, Greek words were uh, translated kind of reflect, in fact, uh, more modern prejudice about um, uh, white superiority against uh, other colors, so to speak, even though uh, Hippocrates himself so refers to various types of complexions, etc. But it's not really it's not really about black and white. It's more about um, differences of, of uh, uh, the human people uh, he has encountered or his audience might encounter across uh, Greece and neighboring regions at the time. Right, so this um, this blog is interesting because, well, first of all, it's uh, it's an attempt at, you know, critiquing uh, translations that may have made too much of the the very Greek words used by the author, Hippocrates or not Hippocrates, and uh, at the same time, it's really a re um, kind of um, it, it, it's really a consequence of modern um, political debates on on um, on race and the classics and how uh, perhaps we can revisit those texts uh, with different um, perspectives, not to say different agendas. And um, I'm 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 just um, I'm not saying I agree with everything in this blog. I'm just bringing it to the debate, uh, hoping that. Um, it may uh, bring additional perspective on on uh, on your work on the Greeks versus the barbarians. Um, so um, I found that rather interesting. My other um, um, my other point is about um, an older piece of scholarship. Um, by uh, Claude Calam, which you may have come across it because it was translated uh, into English in this book I've referenced here. Uh, the book, the English translation was published in 2005 and it's a collection of papers by Claude Calam, right? And the, the actual paper dates back from the uh, um, late 80s or something like that. So it's an old article and it's really not at all part of our current debate, so it won't use the same kind of words. However, it's, uh, it was originally published in a book, um, in a collection on racism. So it was a chapter in a book on the history of racism. Um, and it's about, um, so there is this chapter on uh, Hippocrates' alleged uh, racism. And Kalam brings in a very nuanced reading of the entire work 
um, of the entire text of Hell's Waters and Places to show that um, things are a lot more complicated than that. And it's not just, it, it doesn't just boil down to, you know, stereotypes against the Persians and the superiority of the Greeks, or it's, it's a lot more subtle according to Kalam. And um, in particular, he uh, looks at the, um, the focus of the text and uh, uh, so it's, uh, its perspective is um, uh, more linguistic, if you want, so it's about enunciation, who is talking here and to whom. And uh, he explains that the actual author is not exactly a Greek, like a representative, a representative of uh, of uh, say uh, classical Athens or imperialism in this sense is uh, is a Greek from Asia first point and secondly is uh, is a traveling doctor is one of those traveling doctors and is addressing also this um, uh, this this population of traveling doctors uh, w w which means the the perspective is not really as uh, you could say greek centered exactly it's a lot more diffuse it's a lot more um complicated to pin down to be honest and so whatever he goes on to say uh, about persians about other populations is not really uh as um you know as uh, clear cut as you would or, or as some people would want it to be. And it's, um, it's interesting how his perspective, you know, highlights uh, something totally different from um, what has been highlighted about uh, what Aeschylus or Herodotus do uh, about Greeks versus, versus um, Persians, for instance. So um, it's more about you know, um, showing the text as something open and and perhaps difficult to translate. And this is where the two, uh, those two um, articles kind of meet, is that the issue of translation is really central in, in the way you're going to um, handle this, uh, this kind of evidence. Um, and so Kalam insists on the fact that the very word etnos uh, <laughs> can I, I think only be translated only once with our word race um, and so so it's it's really not quite what it's been you know thought to be uh, in in some discourses as one of the roots of, of um, uh, you know Greek ethnocentrism or something like that so I felt that was uh, an interesting um, thing to bring um, to the debate and I, I'm not delivering here um, any truth about the text of Ezwoters and Places. I just want to highlight the complexity of ancient evidence here uh, and how difficult it is to just summarize um, something for, um, for the perspective of a topic like uh, the, the inventions of the barbarians, the opposition between Greeks and barbarians <clears throat> in a text like this, because of the perspective of the author, because of the nature of the audience, because of the <clears throat> very context of the work, it's, it's actually difficult to uh, pin down uh, something like <clears throat> ethnocentrism or indeed racism. So this is tricky and it was my uh, first point for this uh, lecture. And I hope we can pick this up in the discussion and maybe um, reflect a bit more on, on those questions of translation and what they, they say of our connection with um, classical text uh, in, in, in the, for this particular topic. Uh, my next um, point is uh, is more about Medea and as I said Medea appeared in many <laughs> chapters of my uh, book um, because she's um, a kind of uh, um, archetype of criminal in in so many ways and uh, I ended up so I didn't write a whole chapter on Medea I didn't feel this was the way to 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 do it but uh, she does appear in different contexts and I wanted to highlight a number of uh, aspects of, um, of her character uh, from this perspective. I wanted to highlight some of those uh, features. Um, 
because um, Medea is, is um, okay, we have plenty of female criminals, right, in ancient literature, especially in tragedy. Think of all the <clears throat> those strong women portrayed by not just Euripides, but also Aeschylus and, and Sophocles. Think of Clytemnestra, for example, a criminal, but something uh, uh, um, a bit bigger than that. So some woman who's uh, with, with a, a power, a stature, um, a kind of a special strength, uh, something very masculine about her. And Medea is part of, uh, if you want, a kind of a, constellation of such women but there is something about her that makes that makes her stand out uh, in the history of literature and um, I would like to not just look at um, text of this period just you know Euripides and, and um, surrounding uh, works I would like to look way beyond uh, the, the classical period in Athens and just uh, move beyond this a little. Um, so uh, Medea is interesting for me uh, because she's both a barbarian, you know that Jason at the end of the play in Euripides uh, play um, uh, tells her uh, only a non-Greek would commit such a crime you know, after she has killed their children. Um, and so she is a barbarian she is she certainly is she's also a woman and she, and so she's kind of uh, uh condensing uh, a number of aspects of uh evil uh from the perspective of the ancients uh because uh she um she embodies the all the worrying dangerous aspects of uh of of women as well as foreigners so um medea is um a foreigner, therefore perhaps um, more likely to be cruel, but she's also uh, knowledgeable. She's a sorceress and she's um, a kind of learned, sophisticated person. It's a trait that, that, that gets emphasized not just by Euripides, but also uh, in later works, uh, in Seneca in particular, when you look at the way um, she is um, described in this narrative from her uh, servant uh, while she's performing uh, this, this uh, uh, witch's uh, uh, ceremony. Um, so uh, her knowledge, uh, her foreignness and her female nature all combine in producing something, some character that is especially uh, worrying and dangerous. Now, one thing that fascinated not just me, but also ancient writers and artists uh, generally uh, after Euripides is also her kind of ambivalence. And that's probably just as interesting as her kind of criminal self. Uh, and I think I, I kind of agreed here with Daniel Mendelssohn that she well, not just she, but um, a number of characters in ancient tragedy and literature uh, are not just pure evil, they are ambivalent, they, they have flaws, but somehow that's why they are fascinating and they are not, um, they are not pure expressions of evil, they are something more complex, more ambivalent. And Medea is, is an amazing, uh, example of this, uh, if you look through uh, uh, literature well beyond Euripides, and I've, I've chosen the text here. It's um, a short um, description of um, allegedly a work of art by uh, Callistratus. Um, in this is a fourth century AD text, right? It's very, very far uh, in time from uh, Euripides. But in that um, text, um, um, Callistratus focuses, so he, he's describing or claiming this, he's describing a sculpture of Medea who is about to kill her children and he emphasizes the the moral conflict going on inside that person inside her soul from this you know from the visual 
kind of aspects of the statue, which is remarkable. And um, so whether the statue is real or imagined doesn't really matter here. But what I'm interested in is the fact that what he really is interested in, and, and he, he does reference Euripides, is this, um, th this fleeting moment where she's taken both by um, hatred, the desire of revenge, uh, a kind of anger, and at the same time, pity and, and maternal uh, feelings towards her children. And, and this very ambivalence is encapsulated in this description, real or imagined, uh, of a, a, a statue of Medea. And this is so, so many centuries after Euripides, uh, and it's, it's so fresh, it feels like um, uh, really uh, uh, a very um, uh, fresh description of something that the author um, the a statue that the author has in front of their eyes, but it, it makes Medea come alive, if you want, uh, and it's a description, it's not, uh, it's really not the same kind of text, but uh, it, it's, um, it reveals the same kind of fascination for the, the human character behind the criminal, and that's, uh, okay, so it's just one example, but there are many others, and uh, that's uh, also an aspect of um, uh, inventing the barbarian that I wanted to touch on. Um, the fact that barbarians, like women, um, are an expression um, of um, otherness, of uh, danger, of alterity, of, you know, uh, somehow the opposite of what the you know the writers come from um, in in terms of um, you know male Greek or Roman uh, identity uh, that kind of question. So I, I I'm interested in those characters because they they kind of reveal uh, uh, something when you look at them across different texts, when you look at um, different characters of this type, they reveal something about um, the Greek and Roman psyche, uh, if you like, which I, I found was really fascinating. Uh, so I think I will uh, perhaps um, uh, pause here and, and leave it until we uh, meet for the Q&A. Um, again, it's not I'm not delivering any <laughs> teachings or, or whatever. I just want to stimulate discussion uh, if I can. And, uh, and hopefully, uh, I mean, I look forward to discussing any of those aspects of, uh, of um, my research with you uh, later on. Well, thank you for your attention and see you soon.